around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. Pastor David Langford here today, and we'd like to welcome you to The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Monday. It is February the 8th. We welcome each of you today to this edition. And as always, we trust and we pray that something would be said to encourage you, to strengthen you, to empower you, to embolden you to run the race and finish the course with great joy. Before we get into the program today, we are going to pick back up and talk about the harm of false prophecies, the harm of false prophecies. But before we get into that, I want to share something that to me is profusely exciting, tremendously encouraging, and it strengthens me to know just how far-reaching the voice of evangelism has become. Jordan is able to get into what is called the analytics of our ministry and those who are listening and watching. And we're now in over 100 countries being heard. That's right. We're now in over 100 countries that are listening to the voice of evangelism. And I quickly, I, I want to share with you those countries and just let you see the magnitude of what the Holy Spirit is doing, and I believe firstly and mainly because we're preaching the Word of God. The United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, Kenya, South Africa, France, Nigeria, United Arab Emirates, Japan, Ghana, India, Singapore, Netherlands, Mexico, Germany, New Zealand, Philippines, Switzerland, Colombia, Malaysia, Ireland, Argentina, China, Norway, Sweden, Cameroon, Brazil, Pakistan, Taiwan, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Puerto Rico, Portugal, Vietnam, Austria, Bulgaria, Congo, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Spain, Finland, Hong Kong, Israel, South Korea, Kuwait, Poland, Qatar, Siberia, Russia, Sierra Leone, Azerbaijan, Bahamas, Faroe Islands, Guam, Italy, Jordan, Weimar, Burma, Pan Am, Romania, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, Trinidad, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Anguilla, Barbados, Bangladesh, Bahrain, Bermuda, Barun, Czechia, Denmark, Dominica, Egypt, Ethiopia, Fiji, Guadalupe, Greece, Guatemala, Ghana, Honduras, Croatia, Indonesia, Iraq, Jamaica, Liberia, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Marguritas, Peru, Rwanda, Seychelles, Slovenia, South Sudan, Turks and the Caicos Islands, Turkey, and Tanzania. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that absolutely phenomenal that God has allowed the voice of evangelism to literally go around the world and we have people listening in every one of those countries? I think that's 100 countries. I may have uh, messed up the pronunciation on one or two of them, but uh, did my best to let you know where the voice of evangelism is being heard. I want you also to know it is your love, your support for the ministry that allows us to go and literally to all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without a doubt, our nation is in grave, grave trouble. As I was praying this morning, Proverb 14, 34, righteousness exalteth a nation, 
but sin is a reproach unto any people. I've gotten so many emails and phone calls and letters. People are tremendously discouraged, beleaguered. They don't understand why Trump did not get a second term. All the things he had done relative to abortion, moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, became one of the greatest uh, supporters of ministry and the work of God, and just so many other things, a litany of things that he accomplished or did uh, to bless America. But then the prophecies were heralded with rapidity, you know, four more years for number 45. I am concerned. I am concerned about the lack of humility and the caution that should come in the hearts of those who have prophesied those things yet continue to resist saying, hey, I possibly missed it. I'm going to be talking about that today, but we need to understand Donald Trump is gone. As I shared with you last week, my heart, my affection was for him to be reelected. So uh, I'm not castigating anyone that did. I wanted that. As I said, I learned about a lot about myself having had that desire. But listen, God has a plan and God has a will. We're already watching. I think the last number I had was 40 executive orders by Biden. 40. And see, people are upset now in both houses especially Republicans, because one of those executive orders now denies the power of the Hyde bill, which the bill stated you could not give American money to foreign countries for abortion. But see, Biden overrode that with an executive order, and now your taxpayer dollars are going around the world to kill babies. Now, I know many are adamant that God's going to bless America, it's hard to see how God could bless this nation any more than he did over the last four years. But the question is, did we squander and waste that time and opportunity? How many men ever preached old-fashioned Holy Ghost repentance, cried aloud, named, identified sin in the church, the body of Christ, you just don't hear that kind of preaching. If righteousness exalteth a nation, what do you think wickedness will do to it? It will abase it. It will abase it. We're already seeing and hearing the tremors, the stock market. Uh, the one gentleman, they interviewed him after he lost his job at the XL Pipeline. He wept. He cried. He said, they're moving this oil on the railroads with huge tanker cars. How dangerous is that? It's so much safer, so much more proficient to let us bury this pipeline and get the oil to the refinery the same way, but under the ground. Under the ground. Not above it, under it, so it cannot be encroached, et cetera, et cetera. And the man wept. Pete Butter Judge said, just tell him to go get a, another job. And the man said, this is not a job. This is my career. And I thought about how profound that statement was. It's not a job. It's a career. What is a job? Well, I need to go out here and wash the car. I need to wash the clothes. I need to cut the lawn. Those are jobs. But this man is a pipe fitter or a welder. He said, his, he said he has a career, not a job. So when Pete Butter Judge said, just get you another job, the profoundness of that was it's not a job, it's a career, it's my life, it's who I am. And you're going to see this nation this year slide precipitously. It's going to slide quickly. It's already sliding. Why? Because you have evildoers in leadership. I said you have evildoers in and leadership. And because these people are evil, you can say what you want to. These are evil people. 
They're evil. And what is so disgusting is they all purportedly go to church. And Nancy Pelosi says, all of these foreigners and aliens that come illegally into America, they all have a spark of divinity within them, yet she has no problem murdering babies in a mother's womb. Does that child not have a spark of divinity within it? See, these people are evil and they're corrupt. You know, Donald Trump was able to allow us to see how vile and wicked these people are. He was able to let you and I see, you know, the uh, attorney for the FBI that changed one of the 301s, changed the statement. He's only getting probation. Whoopee, probation. There is a two-tiered justice system. But I've been trying to prepare you for the coming persecution. As soon as we finish this, we're going to go into the series, preparing for the darkness. You say, I don't believe that's going to happen. The way we're going, the way we're living, you're already seeing it right now just in your fuel bill, inflation. It's not going to be pretty. But we honor God with our mouth. We honor God with our lips. But the truth is our hearts are far from him. How can God bless a nation and it continue to be this corrupt? Now, I don't doubt that God is not able to expose some very corrupt things in this nation. That's why I'm praying for judgment. People think that's crazy. They think I'm crazy for praying for judgment. I prayed for judgment this morning. Isaiah 26, verse 9, When thy judgments are in the earth, then the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. These people are not going to learn anything until there's judgment. But here's the caveat. Before judgment begins in the earth, it must first begin where? At the house of God. You see, God is tired of these hooligans who call themselves ministers. They're just as crooked as any politician ever was, maybe more so, because they do it under the disguise of Christianity. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I want to emphasize several things there. Number one, the time has come. Again, that word there, time, in the Greek is kairos, kairos, however you want to pronounce it in the Greek. It is a divine appointed time when foreordained events must come to pass. They cannot be delayed. They cannot be pushed off and said, well, we'll wait one more week. We'll wait two more weeks. No, it has to come to fruition. And the judgment must begin at the house of God. That was the exact protocol in Ezekiel chapter 9, when the angels went through the city and they put a mark on the forehead of those who wept and sighed and cried and prayed over the abominations that were in Jerusalem. And he told the angel, go to the temple and start at the altar. Before God went out, before God went out, into Jerusalem to smite those who did not weep and cry and pray and mourn and lament for the wickedness. For he went out to the people outside of the temple. He started at the temple. And then he went from there and worked his way outward. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. And if it first began with us, 
what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? You know, people want to act like the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are pretty uh, plain, very simple, mundane, and don't really say anything about anything. Well, you're badly mistaken. Jesus addressed Noah. Jesus addressed Lot. Jesus addressed fornication. Jesus addressed drunkenness. He addressed adultery. But you don't want to look at Jesus as being a righteous judge, many. But they don't want to look at Jesus like that. Oh, he's love, he's compassion, long-suffering, merciful. Those are all the attributes of God. But Psalms 9, 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 7, 11, God is angry with the wicked every day. You see, God has a loving, compassionate side, God also has a judgment side, a side of conviction. Why? Because he is a just God. Now, if the righteous scarcely be saved, if you and I who are righteous, redeemed, blood-bought saints of God, scarcely, barely, nighly, but that's probably not a word, nighly, but nigh getting in. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Notice the distinction between the ungodly and the sinner. Some would say, well, they're the same thing. No, they're not. A sinner's never been born again. They're still a sinner. Oh, but the ungodly, the ungodly have known him. They became godly. They walked away from God. Now they are ungodly. You see, this kind of preaching does not bode well with the nominal, flippant, tepid, lukewarm, indifferent, backslidden Christian. Just It just doesn't go over well. I don't like that preacher. That doesn't matter to God whether you like the preacher or not. People didn't like Jesus, so they killed him. I said they didn't like Jesus, so they killed him. You think it bothers me when people say, I don't like him? Or someone says, hey, we'd love for you to listen to this, this preacher. And then when they do, they say, oh, he's hellfire and brimstone. We don't want to hear that. By the way, I thank you for sharing this program with others. The fact that one sister shared this program to her, her sister, her sister turned to the Lord, gave up her sins, repented, and started following the Lord Jesus. Just because someone doesn't like it doesn't mean we shouldn't attempt to share the gospel or tell them, hey, listen to what this man said is preaching relative to the Word of God. It'll not be me that convicts them. It'll be the power and the Spirit of Christ. It'll be the Holy Ghost. It'll be the Word of God that goes forth like a two-edged sword, and it will pierce their soul and their spirit, their joints and their marrow, and it will affect their lives. It will affect their lives. We get the testimonies all the time. People in drugs, into alcohol, fornicating. Even here and there, we, we get a, a homosexual who says, I've, I've repented, I've turned from my wicked ways. That's, that's what we are in the business for. You know, and I pray to this day, God, give me tens of thousands of souls. If the rest of the ministry and ministers do not desire these souls, God, give them to me. Let me win them. If they don't care for them, they have these huge behemoth for platforms spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year to be on television, and we're not spending 
a drop in the bucket compared to that, but we're reaching people in 100 countries around the world. The gospel is going to go into the world and it's going to be preached unto all before the end comes. Now, you know, we went through a lot of hype just a little while back with the vaccine. People are getting the vaccine. Uh, I think they're trying to get up to one and a half million a day or maybe even more by now. And you're seeing the frenzy, the blood in the water frenzy waning concerning the mark of the beast, all of those things, because it's, it's, it's almost a fad. A situation arises, a situation occurs, and then they become purveyors of that. And that's very concerning to me. I have concluded there are a lot of people who claim they're Christians, they claim they're in Jesus and they're into Christianity, but they're purveyors of disinformation. That's not to be ugly here because we all can be deceived. I was thinking about deception. How does one truly become deceived? How do you genuinely truly, biblically qualified to be deceived. How is that possible? Please be patient with me today. How does one who claims to be a Christian, who claims to be spirit-filled and led by the Holy Ghost, how do they become deceived? How is it? I'll tell you how. They refuse to believe the truth. If I give you the truth and you spurn it, you reject it, and you say, I do not believe that, you, my friend, are being deceived, providing what I'm saying is the truth. Anything that's false, look it up in your dictionary, or for that matter, and the strong exhaustive concordance. Anything that is false is fraudulent. It's a type of dishonesty, a type of manipulation. It is a type of coercion into getting you to believe something that is true, that it's false. Or to try to get someone to believe something that is false is true. Satan is a master at skewing the lines. He's a master at making the way broad. When Jesus says, it is straight, it is narrow, and few there be that find it. This, this way is not near as broad as some ministries would have you to believe. I'd rather be too straight and too narrow than too crooked and broad. Now, you have a choice just like I have a choice. Our lives are rooted and grounded in choices. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. If you don't have a choice, you're not truly free. If all you can get is vanilla ice cream, you don't have a choice. You, you don't have a choice. But if you have chocolate and butter pecan and uh, raspberry and blueberry and whatever, you have choice. You can, you can make a different choice than I make, vice versa. I can make a different choice than you make. But we're not talking about ice cream. We're talking about God's way or the way of the world. The reason I got just another email the other over the weekend, people are discouraged, they are diswrought, they've been harmed, they've been harmed emotionally, 
and they've been harmed spiritually. This has injured the faith in God, in God's Word, and of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This has all now come into question. The validity, the veracity, the authenticity of God and who God is. I've said this before, I'll say it again. I personally have probably quenched, grieved, and resisted the Holy Ghost as many times as I have submitted to the Holy Ghost regarding spiritual gifts. Let me say that again. I have probably resisted, quenched, and grieved the Holy Spirit as many times as I have in obeying and submitting my vessel to the gifts of God and the Holy Ghost. Now, why would I say that? Because my fear of using the phrase, thus saith the Lord, and it not being God, but being something from my own vain heart, my own vain mind, and try to attach it to God and say, this act, this word, this whatever it is, was from God, and it wasn't. That frightens me, and I have great fear. As I said, that's why I've probably quenched and grieved and resisted the Holy Ghost, because I always want to be so certitude that it's not me, it's God. There's a fine line, I know. If you've ever been used in the gifts of the Spirit, there's a very fine line between your spirit and the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not hard to cross over from the Holy Spirit because you are inspired, you are unctionized, you're flowing. It's not hard to get out of that into your own spirit and say things that God never said. Now, we see that all the time. The dear lady that prophesied Trump would be the 46th president, that prophecy, when, as soon as I heard it, I said, that's crazy. God knows better than to give the president the wrong number. And if Donald Trump had to be reelected, he would have been the 45th president again. He doesn't get a new number. See? Hussein Obama got two terms, but he was always 44. First term, second term, 44. People prophesied Trump would get four more years, and then Pence would follow it up by eight more consecutive years. I don't mean to be hard. That's false prophecy. You don't understand. You're not waiting on God. You're not trusting God enough yet. Oh, I'm trusting God. And I am praying fervently all the time. Now, there's, there's something going to happen. But we're not going to like what happens. There could be great, great exposure and corruptness in the government. It's there. We know it's there without a doubt. My God, you'd have to be blind to not know and deaf to not hear that there is corruption in this government. All of them, all government has corruption in it. I was talking to a brother just last night, and I was sharing. It's not the people. It wasn't the German people. It was Hitler, Himmler, Mao, Stalin, Lenin. These leaders get their people into malicious, barbarous wars. Not the people, but the leadership. The leadership. 
was listening to a World War II documentary the other day. And one of the guys that survived World War II, and he was very, very up in age now, he said, you know, some of the German men I killed, we might have we might have could have been buddies. Fishing, hunting, carpentry. He said, but the leader sent me over there. Had no recourse. This is why we pray for all of those who are in authority, Paul said. It's hard to pray for Biden, but I do. Hard to pray for Kamala, but I do. Why? Because the Bible commands me to pray for those that are in authority. Why? That we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. Don't be surprised if in this year we're already in war somewhere with another nation. One of Trump's great achievements was not starting or getting into a war and getting the, the troops home. I think it was George Bush, too, after Obama went in, he said, do you miss me now? After this administration, people will beg and pray for God to put Trump back in. My concern right now is those that are hurt. Those that now question the word of the Lord, prophecies, the gifts of the Spirit. That is my concern. What is all this fake news, disinformation, and false prophecies done to me? What's it done to you, Pastor? Has it done anything to you? Yes. I'll tell you what it did to me. It's made me more determined to pray and stay immersed in the Word of God. Prophecies, Paul said, they, they will fail. A lot of debate over that phraseology there and exactly what it means. It was Jesus, the Lord's Christ, that warned us about false prophets. It was Christ, the Son of God, Jesus himself, and the book of John is called the prophet, meaning he's the one of great, 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 great significance when it comes to prophets. Uh, John 7, verse 40, many of the people therefore when they heard this saying said of a truth, this is the prophet. This is the prophet. But Jesus warned us of the dangers of false prophets. So let me say this. If there's a warning there's a signal, there is an alarm for false prophets. Shouldn't there be one for false prophecies? Please do not get angry with me. Do not get belligerent with me and attack me when I share the word of the Lord. Matthew 7, 15, 16 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you wearing sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You, you calling all these men, you calling all these women false prophets? I'm telling you what the word of the Lord says. Beware of false prophets Beware. That, 
when you are being aware of what's going on in your environment, you are sober, you are vigilant, you're watching, you're listening, you're 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 trying your best to be very keen as to what's taking place and what's going on around you. But if you don't, your awareness, if you don't, your awareness is diminished. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. It was Christ that warned us about false prophets. Matthew 24, 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What's the purpose in deceiving people? Making them believe that what they're listening to, they're hearing or seeing is true, but it's false. It's false. This is the power of the Antichrist. Power, signs, and lying wonders. I want to be careful what I say, but are we being set up in the very near future for the revelation of the Antichrist? Now, I've said before, I'm looking first for civil war, then a third world war, and then the revelation of the Antichrist. If inflation sets in like I think it will, there will be grave trouble because the the economies of the world will need material, food. You compound that with drought, famine, bad weather, different things happening can get very, very disturbing quickly. Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. I'm going to say something here. Don't get mad. Admittedly, and you know I'm telling you the truth, you're witnessing, seeing, and hearing more prophets than you have 20 years ago. Prophets have grown tremendously in the last several decades. Everyone wanted to call David Wilkerson a prophet, but he always called himself a pastor. He never took the office of a prophet. He understood the gravity of a true prophet. And I don't need to tell you if you read your Bible, most prophets just came preaching the judgment of God, the warnings of God, get right with God or be destroyed. But today, most prophecies and prophets are about blessings. Blessings, blessings, blessings. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The, the, uh, the great book of Deuteronomy Chapter 28, you all know it, the blessings and the cursings, the blessings and the cursings. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, there were 68 verses. The first 14 talk about blessings. The last 55 talk about curses. Think about what I just said, almost a a five-to-one ratio. God makes it very simple. Just live right, I'll bless you. Live a life of sin, look at all 
Look at all the negative things that will happen in your life. And we are about to enter into a stage and a state of time that's very, very negative. I have no joy in saying that. That troubles me. It rains on the just and the unjust. Rains on all of us. Some of us get too much rain. Some of us don't get enough rain. In the Civil War, you've heard me mention the barbarity of those men getting killed, 600,000, 2 million terribly wounded. And of course, Robert E. Lee surrendered to Sherman, and Lincoln was elated. He was re-elected, Lincoln was. The Civil War was stopped. Then Lincoln was assassinated. That's what put uh, Ulysses Grant into the uh, White House. I might have said Sherman a minute ago. I didn't mean to say Sherman. He was a general, and of course, the British named one of the tanks, if I remember correctly, a Sherman tank. Ulysses S. Grant accepted the surrender of Robert E. Lee. And it looked like everything was just just going to be great. The nation would be restored and made whole, but then John Wilkes Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln. And it was a, a very troublesome time in America. And then they got into the, the mode, the Congress, the Senate developed the Reconstruction Act to rebuild the nation. Why am I telling you all of that? Because right now, we're, we're, we're almost in the throes of something very similar to that. It's concerning. Is troubling. And the things I hear, the things I see today are really troubling me. I heard a lady the other day, I mean, I may have shared this. She has a television program. She said she was looking for Democratic prophets and see if they prophesy about Biden winning the election. She said, I know there's some good, godly, Christian, democratic prophets. And I thought, dear lady, your mind is toast. There's neither a Democrat or Republican prophet. There are prophets of God and there are prophets of Baal. You want to call a Democrat or prophet of Baal, okay. But I thought the, the craziness, I'm, this is cynical to say, I'm looking for a democratic prophet and to see if they ever prophesied Biden would be the president. I'm like, this, this, this stuff is just so, so, so out there under the name of Christianity. That's what is greatly, greatly troubling. Listen to another verse, Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. One translation says, it is not possible for the elect to be deceived. But Jesus said, if it were possible, this is why we have to be focused on Christ and not prophecy and prophets. Your focus, your affection, your love, your inspiration to run the race and serve the Lord Jesus Christ does not come from prophecy and prophets. It truly comes from the Word of God. 
I believe in prophecy. I thank God for prophecy, as I have said. It edifies the body, it uplifts the church, and it glorifies Christ. But we have, Peter said, a more sure word. In other words, the word of God, Peter says, is more sure than prophecies. We, 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 we take the word of God, we hide it in our hearts. Why? Because there's power in the word of the Lord. But Peter understood that the word of the Lord has preeminence over prophetic words and utterances because sometimes they become skewed, sometimes they become flawed. Now remember, false Christ coupled with false prophets, what will they both do? Show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, that is a very disturbing statement from the Son of God. It is a very, very disturbing statement from the Son of God. I thought I could get through today, but I'm not going to be able to make it. And you will not want to miss tomorrow because I'm going to share a lot of Bible Scripture from the Old Testament. Now let's look at the word false in the Greek. Pseudo prophetes. Pseudo means not genuine, something that is a sham. The entire Greek word for pseudo prophetes means a spurious or an illegitimate prophet a pretended foreteller or a religious imposter. I know some of you will say, is that what you're calling all of these people, religious imposters? I'm not calling anybody anything. I'm telling you to do what 1 John 4, 1 says. The Bible tells us in the last days, Prophets, prophets are going to arise. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Many false prophets. First John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit, or the spirits, try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. I didn't say that. John the Beloved said that. Believe not every spirit. I will say this. There were prophecies that I heard I knew were absolutely erroneous, bogus. They were crazy. Why? Why? Because the prophecies were injured and harmed by the word of God. Jeremiah 23, 29, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces? The God's word was breaking apart those false prophecies. You hear me say this. You've got to reconcile all the scriptures. When you don't reconcile them, that's how you start preaching fallacy. That's how you start preaching heresy because you don't know this verse is over there in the Bible and you've not bothered to research it and study it and make it synchronous with the rest of the Bible. So when the gentleman was prophesying Trump would never leave office, Tel Aviv, when we move the embassy, U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, this person said, the embassy in Jerusalem, U.S. Embassy, will be destroyed. Israel will be destroyed. They'll be run out of Israel. Total, be run completely out of their nation. America would take out, under the Trump presidency, Iran and Syria. And then 
China, Russia would take out America. The man said Trump would never leave the office. I will give him his dues. He says he's going to take down his television program for having missed it. I don't know whether he will or not. It's up to him. I don't have anything to do with that. My point is, I knew that prophecy could not be true. On one verse, Zechariah 14 and 2, Israel is going to have all of Jerusalem, and the Antichrist is going to seize half of it. So how can you be exiled from your country yet holding on to half of Jerusalem? You can't. Obviously, he didn't figure that out or didn't see it or didn't know it or doesn't understand it. And something is spurious. It's not what it seems to be because it's false or it is fake. Now, there are the scriptures in Matthew 5, excuse me, Matthew 7, Verses 15, 16, Matthew 24, 11, Matthew 24, 24, 1 John 4, 1. Many false prophets. We hear that with rapidity from Christ and now even John the Beloved. He's saying the same thing. He's saying the same identical thing concerning false prophets. Many shall arise. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary says the word false means something that is intentionally untrue, something that lacks sincerity, inaccurate, mistaken ideas brought about through pride, and something that is truly inconsistent with the truth and with the facts. I, I really loved it the other day as Rand Paul smacked down George Stephanopoulos. I mean, he smacked him down on Good Morning America or maybe the Sunday edition. I don't know. I didn't see it till afterward. But he said, you guys think y'all are the only ones that have the truth and that we have no truth. But he said there was election fraud. There was a lot of things that were messed up. But because you, the media, says it's not true doesn't mean it's not true because y'all don't have all the truth. You don't want all the truth. And you won't let the truth come out many times. The last days, remember this, the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous or dangerous times shall come. Think about that. Dangerous times. Is this not a time of danger? Danger in so many ways. Danger of listening to false prophets and their prophecies and being misled. I know those of you listening to this program, you sincerely do not ever want to be this misled. And I promise you, my intent is to never mislead you. I would never want to mislead anybody. Why? Because misleading is deception. I was so disappointed in so many ministries that took PPE money or whatever you want to call it, small business, personal protection equipment, PPE. But for the ministries, that was millions of dollars you see, you can witness the church, the nominal church, getting in bed with the harlot. You, you can see these things. Now, you know, we are becoming desensitized and we're slowly but surely sliding into a state and a place where we're fulfilling Bible prophecy, but we will declare emphatically, no, we're not. Remember, the mother of harlots she rides the beast. Someone asked me the other day about Babylon versus Mystery Babylon. I believe Mystery Babylon is the harlot church. I do believe literal physical Babylon is America. A lot of 
debate and argument about that. But I know one thing, America has made all the nations of the world very lucrative and rich. And when Babylon is destroyed, they stand afar off and they're weeping and they're sighing and they're crying and as they watch the billowing smoke, a lot of people thought that was 9-11 when the Twin Towers were billowing and the smoke was blowing across the bay. Very much like what we would look for in that Bible prophecy in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. But I do believe that Mystery Babylon is the harlot church and system. And so you see how government now has gotten in to bed with many ministries who took money. You have to be careful. By the way, that's exactly what prostitutes do. They accept money for doing things. It is sad. It is intentional that they do these things. But we must be careful. I'm going to pick this back up tomorrow. That'll be the end of this. I won't address it. I won't mention it anymore. Next week, we're going to start with preparing for the darkness but there's been so much harm and injury and people have been uh, offended and negatively affected by the false prophecies. I just felt it's imperative that we at least talk about it, not live a life of denial, but look at it through the lens of the Word of God and see what God's Word says concerning false prophecies and prophets in the last days. Let me encourage you to pray for each of those ministries, regrettably, some continue to speak words that their prophecies are still going to come to pass, and they're not, they're not recanting, they're not apologizing, they're not saying, they're not doing anything. That's how you harden your heart. I said that's how you harden your heart, and you embrace a mistruth, you accept it, a lie as the truth and you believe something that's false. Stay in God and in God's Word. God will not disappoint you. God will not let you down. God will get you through. Whatever you think you're facing right now, you got to trust the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge the Lord, and He will direct your path. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great evening. And I pray the Lord forever order your steps in His most holy word. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.